A noble underachiever and a beautiful valedictorian fall in love the summer before she goes off to college. This is the Cult Faction Podcast, episode 67, Spotlight On. Say anything. (laughs) Ah, Superman. Hello and welcome to the Cult Faction Podcast, episode 67, our teen odyssey vacation summer summer special specials continue <laughs> with the spotlight on Say Anything. It's quite niche. It is quite niche. <laughs> I am your host, Damien Hicks, and I am joined by Brett Summers and also... Paul Hawkins. See, I was going to say as always, and then I suddenly yeah, remembered I that I, I we, see, this, that, that never happens now. Yeah. It's a chopping and a changing and a changing and a chopping. A moving and a grooving. Rocking and a rolling. Thank you. Go, so, go, go, do, yeah, spotlight on saying anything, but before we do that, what's going down in Groove Town? Mr. Been, Hawkins. Been recording podcasts. Have you? Since last time, yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> not, not much else since then. That's about it. Work. <laughs> podcasts. Work podcasts. That's it. Fair enough, it's Mr. Summers. Nice. Yeah, I've just been enjoying the summer holidays, catching some rays, putting my feet up, watching the Commonwealth Games, just enjoying life. Cool. Okay. See, with the Commonwealth Games... <laughs> I could see it in his eye. That's what that was. What that little pause was because I could see a cog turning. So yeah, go it's a, on. It's a bit like a like, like a school sports day in, in many ways, isn't it? Well, it's a little bit better than that. Yeah, but the, the <laughs> like, thing I there's like no about, egg and spoon race. Well, isn't there? No, but the thing I like about it is it's it's, it's all the random stuff as well, isn't it? You know, it, yeah, yeah. You've got your swimming, um, but you've also got things like netball. Yep, Wait, that's what? in that. In, that's in the Olympics, isn't it? I don't know. Uh, I think so. But but I think it's where it's like the Commonwealth as well. It's like, oh, didn't 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 Cyprus do really well? And even though the, the, the or whoever is it that well, Gibraltar- Guernsey got a bronze in the bowls. <clears throat> yeah, last or, week or, or Gibraltar when when they're, they're finishing like two two lengths of the swim after everyone else, but everyone's really ch- clip clapping them on. That's like, called sportsmanship. Don't worry, you'll still yeah. get a winner's certificate. You might not be a medal, but you, you really took part and did really well. I like that about the Commonwealth Games. And also, the, the really cool thing as well is you've got the, 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 the uh, I was going to say Paralympians, but, but yeah, well, but yeah, it's not the Olympics. Yeah. But, I know what you mean. But they've got them at the same time. So I think that's really cool because that's putting them on a pedestal, literally. Yeah. With, with, well, it's um, equal, for yeah, it's lack of a better part. term, equal footing. With, with, with other athletes as well. And you think, you wouldn't get this in China. You wouldn't get this in Russia. So, so, yeah, hats off. Hats off to the Commonwealth Games. God bless you. Okay. Well, my week has been taken up racing a DeLorean with the Trans Am. Because after building all the stuff that I built out in the garden, I finally allowed myself cars. to open... <laughs> no, I finally allowed myself to open my new Sky Electrics. It's cool. Have you been sat on it, like, all day? Have you let other people have a go yet? You're like, no, you just don't appreciate like I do. Go away, children. Yeah, no one's allowed to touch it. I had a go on it. <gasps> Which one? Which, right. What did you go for first? Well, what the do you Trans think? Am what, or the what, what do you think he made me use? The DeLorean. name? No, the Trans Am. I, I had I've been, obviously no, no, I was being sarcastic. no chance of, of, of using the, you know, uh, the DeLorean. But Kit's got the little flashy lights at the start. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And it actually stays on. So you let your finger off the trigger... There's obviously a little bit of residual power, so it still carries on going. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, I think, I think it's, I think, I think I can safely say, if you keep an eye on our TikTok, you might see some scale electric DeLorean versus Knight Rider action. Yep. So you can see what all the. Fuss I want. I need about. to. <clears throat> I need to figure out a track configuration that allows me to keep it up. 
Hey. Okay. <laughs> allows me to keep it out, if you like, and still do this podcast. <clears throat> because let's be honest, you two are not the most elegant of people walking in and out of a room or getting in and out of a chair. Never claimed to be. So <laughs> I, there's no way I can leave it down. And I would still say do this that recording. makes sense. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, that's enough of that. TV, film-wise, anyone watched anything since our previous recording? Yep. I have now finally, after all these weeks, caught <laughs> up with um, South Park, The Streaming Wars Part 2 oh. on the Paramount Plus app, if you've seen that. I may have mentioned that before. You have mentioned um, it before. I glazed over. But but it's no, but it's great because everything is coming straight on there. It's like, oh, it's out in America. Um, I have to see when it's out in England. And it's already on there. And it's like, um, yeah. I don't know if they've worked that out yet or not, but I think we even get when, things... When you pay for Paramount Plus. Well, I get it free because I've got Sky Movies. Yeah, yeah, but, but it's a, yeah, normal Yeah, yeah, no, but, it, so but, it's but I don't know if they've realised... I don't think Paramount Plus have factored in the time difference yet. I think it's like, when it gets to like midnight and it becomes the next day over here, it becomes available. Because like the Orville, I'd done a review the other week of one of the episodes, the second to last episode that I talked about last episode, and my review was up before it was on in America. Oh, I see what you mean. So I think, you know, <clears throat> so we get, it's only like five or six hours difference, but if it's on it, say, nine o'clock at night on Hulu in America, we've got it like from midnight or 9am that morning. So, it, you know, we're, we're, we're doing all right out of it, really. Don't listen to me, Paramount Plus. Keep it the same, please. But yeah, South Park Stream Wars Part 2, very clever. The first one was a little bit long, still funny, but this, um, yeah, it, it, it pulls it back together, delivers it, and um, is well worth a watch. But to be fair, since the, um, the COVID special, the post-COVID special, and then the post-COVID special, the return of COVID, um, there's been sort of some long-term storytelling in South Park that... I don't want to get into if you haven't seen it because things pay off. Get, I'm never going to see it, it. So, yeah, but well, you'll like it anyway. <clears throat> but you won't watch it because it's a cartoon. Don't watch cartoons. I'm a grown up. But uh, yeah, that was cool. And also, I have been diving into. Oh, actually, I'll come back to that one. Paul, what have you been watching? <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to start with Operation Mincemeat. <laughs> Oh, right, yeah. No, the uh, uh, and this isn't you know, an advert for, for Grind or anything like that. No, <laughs> th th this is um, World War II uh, drama, Colin Firth, Kelly MacDonald and uh, Matthew McFadden. This is about um, trying to pull the wall over Nazi Germany's eyes and trying to convince them that the Allied forces are going to storm one place as opposed to the most obvious target. They do this by concocting a plan to um, basically dump some... Uh, official documents onto a body and let that wash up on shore and then make its way through to the, the, the echelons of, of Nazi power to then, as I said, convince them that the Allied forces are going to attack some other country. Um, it's a right... It's not... If we, if we, and I, I, I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to big up the operation. It's only going to work if it's a convincing story. But they spend so much time on creating this, you know, random person that doesn't exist, and that a lot of it is just, you know, the the the, the preamble of, well, he's he's got a girlfriend. Oh, well, we need to, to go into the backstory and make it believable. Who is she? What does she do? Whether do they meet? What does he really think? And and you know, you just get a bit bored of it. No, seriously, they, they just go on so much. And yes, I, I get, you know, they needed to build up a backstory to make it convincing. But at the end of the day, they shove one letter of, from, from his made-up girlfriend on him. Uh, and then they, sh they have the uh, uh, official documents. And you just kind of think, well, it's a lot of padding, you know. And there's a kind of love triangle going on between uh, Colin Firth, Kelly MacDonald and, and the, the, the other lead actor that doesn't really amount to anything uh, and yeah it, it's interesting to see how they they, they, they basically um, come to, to, to blows over the fact that they're after the same girl but he's married anyway and his wife's you know gone to America with his kids so nothing's really going to happen you know nothing's really going to happen anyway um, and Colin Firth's brother might be a spy but they don't really delve into the backgrounds of his spy 
yeah, uh, makeup or anything like that. It's just, well, I'm going to you know, maybe use that as a, a bargaining chip to, to play off against um, the, the, the upper MI5 to, 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 to progress my career, all this kind of stuff. Um, there's just a lot better Second World War films out there, uh, you know, um, most recently with Gary Oldman when he played Churchill in like The Darkest Hours or whatever it was, really good. Um, and, and this you know, kind of fell a bit flat. Um, okay, five before you ten. move on, how much? Five out of ten, did you just say? Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Okay. Who's moved my cars? Uh, that was me and uh, Emily. Okay. It wasn't me. Em Emily wanted to, to show me the cars, Daddy's cars. So I let her pick one up and I said, what one's your favourite one? And she said, the DeLorean. So she should. Well, she didn't say the DeLorean. She went that one. That one, yeah. <laughs> I want that one. That one, please. And then we put them back. But obviously not in not the right in place. Not in the right place, no. <sighs> okay. Ca you can carry on now. Okay, yeah, so that was Operation Mince Me. Um, the other one I have been watching uh, on Netflix, uh, Man from Toronto. So this is Woody Harrison, Kevin Hart, um, in a... Hilarious uh, comedy. Um, <laughs> it don't sound convincing. Yeah, it's all right. So, so Kevin Hart plays basically a down and out businessman that's not really successful in anything he does. There's some funny scenes. <laughs> Kevin, he plays Kevin Hart. Yeah. <laughs> um, he takes his wife away on like a, a, a weekend away to try and um, gloss over the fact that his latest business deal hasn't been given the go ahead by somebody needed for backing. Whilst he's there, he goes ahead to um, like a cabin to, to make it all nice with like candles and stuff like that. Picks the wrong cabin um, and ends up, um, you know, basically walking in with some crime people trying to get something out of uh, a hostage. They think he's a hitman. He has to play along, otherwise, he's dead. Um, CIA, basically, or the FBI, one of them, basically raid the place um, and you know, they they work out quite quickly. He's not really the hitman, but then he has to play along because otherwise they're they're not going to get to the real bad guy. Woody Harrison, who is the bad guy, finds out that Kevin Hart's taking his um, position. Is he a crazy dislodged type of character? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. He's a hitman, um, or, and then or, or Woody Harrelson, <laughs> and then ends up you know basically taking Kevin Hart um, on. To, to carry on being him, otherwise he can't get to, the, to, to his, his millions at the end of it. And he needs his millions because he wants to open up a restaurant. And lo and behold, even though Woody Harrison is a hitman and you know, obviously hates um, Kevin Hart and wants him dead, they become really good friends and best friends because they both teach each other something about life. Sounds <sighs> a bit like Empire Records. It's... Uh, uh, I wanted to like it more than I think I did, and I wanted to hate it more than I did. It's all right. There, there's some uh, a few funny scenes. Um, Woody Harrison again, you know, not not not, not breaking the boundaries on anything that Woody Harrison does. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's all right. It's watchable. It's weird though, isn't it, that the simple yet lovable barman from Cheers has gone <laughs> on to play some of the most <laughs> mentally deranged people in cinematic history. Well, yeah, he, he doesn't do any of that. He's more like a nice hit guy in this one. Yeah. Um, See, in my head, I was like, morning, Mr. Peterson. <laughs> and now yeah. he's like, you know, Mickey and Mallory and all that. Yeah. As I said, it's, it's not really violent, which is a good thing. It's just comedy, but it's not really that funny. But there's some chuckle moments. Uh, probably a six and a half out of ten. Mm, Fair cool. enough. Cool. Mr. Summers, you've watched anything else? Yeah, I've gone back in time, not with your DeLorean scale electric set, but with Sky Arts, who, as I mentioned previously, have started running all the Alfred Hitchcock Presents from the 1955 series onwards. Um, and I dived in and did a sort of retro review on the very first episode, season one, episode one. It's called Revenge. It's based off a short story by Samuel Blass, which I thought was then quite cheeky to be an Alfred Hitchcock Presents if he's just made it on someone else's story. But I suppose it's him as a director that we're... In, he's, it's his we're interpretation, yeah, his interpretation of the original yes. text for um, the screen. 
Yeah, and it, it, we follow a husband and wife, um, Carl, played by Ralph Mika, and Elsa, played by Vera Miles, who would later turn up in uh, Psycho as, um, I forget the character, isn't it? Janet Lee's sister. Okay. He's like, she's scared, you killed her, and then she ends up in Psycho 2 as well, which is, uh, which is the, the better of the two films. Um, yeah, and basically, in Revenge... They're a couple, they've moved out to sort of like, the, they're living in a caravan in some sort of, I know it's on the beach side or the countryside, it's sort of out the way a bit on a caravan park because she's had some sort of breakdown in the city and they need to sort of rest and recuperate and all that. And then um, he goes out for the shopping one day and comes back and she, um, she's she been attacked or something's happened to her and she's all like knocked out and disheveled and he's like, oh, who was it or whatever. And you get the impression that before this he might have been like an army guy. Well, actually it's 1955, everyone's been an army guy, haven't they, at yeah. that point? Yeah, you know, you get that impression that he's got some sort of background about him. And he's like, oh, do you know who it was? And she said, if I saw him again, I'd know who it was and all that. And he's like, okay. And then um, the police come and the doctor comes and the doctor says like you know based on their breakdown for her, just take her further down the coast get away from everyone just let her chill out it will help her relax etc he's like okay and then so as they're driving down to the next town she spots the guy and goes that's the guy that's the guy and he like pulls up the thing and follows the guy around the town goes up into the hotel smacks him with a spanner which apparently kills him but you know, you don't really see it because it's 1955 and I don't think you'd kill anyone with that. He might have wrote his knuckle or something because it's <laughs> not like the biggest spanner. I'm kind of mimicking it with my hand at the moment, which you can't see but because it wasn't that good. But basically, he kills the guy. Is that what you're doing? He, he comes, yeah, nothing else. I was concerned. Um, I thought you were describing the, 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 the film. And then, um, so then he runs back to the car and they're right. He's like, I got him, I got him. And they're driving down. As they carry on down the road, she screams out again, that's the guy there, that's the guy there. And then he looks and stops. And like, and he's like, and then he looks at her again. And then someone else walks by and he's like, that's the guy there, that's the guy there. Then as that's happening, you've got the police sirens getting louder in the background. And I'm guessing the idea is that, um, Vera's a bit crazy. Sounds and, like it. And was she even attacked to begin with? And I mean, considering it was made in 1955, I'd give it a solid 7 out of 10. It, but it could have, for an audience nowadays, I think it needed to just make those points a little bit more. I mean, it's only like 25 minutes, half an hour's like episodes, but it just seemed, it just rushed through it a little bit. Whereas maybe, maybe we needed to just see her be. Need a little time bit to more. Breathe. Well, yeah, give it time to breathe, but just to see her, to put that thing in, because I get that it's a twist and that she is crazy, but it kind of just came out of nowhere. Rather than you know, she could do a few more like weird looks to the camera or something, you know, like that. Just kind of give us that, sow that seed, so when it does come out, we're like, oh my god, yeah, she is mental or crazy or as mental health problems as we say nowadays mm -hmm. not the 1955 lingo um but yeah it was good apparently i have not seen it yet and i'm trying to look for it when he did alfred hitchcock presents again in 1985 he remade it all right okay and so he took the script again and with different people i can't remember the cast now so i'd be interested to see that one but i don't think sky arts has got that yet i think we've got all the original like 1955 to 1960 or whatever it was series on there so i will dive in and out of them but it's, it's worth a watch it's again 20 minutes half an hour if you're stuck for something to watch while you're eating your dinner you know chuck it on and blow your mind but one other thing i did want to mention and i was going to ask it to you guys i've not watched it yet but has anyone watched paper girls on amazon at the moment no, this, no, this yeah. is blowing up a bit no, I've not even heard of it. And I, no, it night. passed me as well. Yeah, it's, it's uh, to quote, four young friends' paper routes are disrupted on Hell Day 1988 when they unknowingly time travel, Damien, Ooh. to 2019. While searching for a way home, they clash with members of the two time-jumping factions at war and must come face-to-face -face with their adult selves and learn how to work together to save the world. And it's a series, it's on Amazon, and the last couple of days, or last week or so, it's sort of been blown out and people are starting to talk about it and stuff. It's, yeah, it's all on Amazon. Um, I'm not sure how many episodes there are, but I'm sure 
There's a few. I think there's about eight. Okay. And um, it does sound a bit Stranger Things for girls, <laughs> if we're going to be blunt, because it does, you know, it's the 80s, but it's a girl gang that's done all paper girls. But, and looking at the picture, every box is ticked. Um, you know, there's a grungy one, the sports girl, the weirdo, the nice girl, you know, all on paper. But it seems to be, this is becoming a thing with the young kids, y'all. Okay, well, there we go then. We should watch that and then we can all report back next week. Yeah. Okay. So, Cage Watch. Cage Watch. Cage Watch. Oh, Cage Watch. Oh, yeah. Hashtag Cage Watch. Unbearable weight of massive talent. Oh, have you seen it? Yeah. Go so, on. I do want to see this. <clears throat> so this is Nick Cage um, taking on the role of Nicholas Cage. Cage. <laughs> but not just one Nicholas Cage. Oh, no. Pretty much most of his back catalogue of, of classic roles as well. They, they all come back. Uh, most of them talk either talk to him in, in split scenes or whatever. So, so this stars Nick Cage as Nick Cage, Pedro Pascal as an evil, um, maybe gangster bo- boss. Uh, Neil Patrick Harris as Nick Cage's manager, Sharon Horgan as his wife, and Lily Mo Sheen, a.k.a. Kate Beckinsale and Michael Sheen's daughter, uh, as Nick's daughter. Um, so, yeah, this is basically Nick Cage wanted a, a, a role in, in a new film, doesn't get it, reflects on his life, basically he's going to give up acting, um, has a lot of debt, has to take on one more job and this job is just going out and hanging out with a rich guy um, I, aka Pedro Pascal um, whilst he's there he gets uh, approached by, by the this probably the FBI or CIA I can't remember which one to to basically work out um, if Pedro Pascal has kidnapped um, uh, an official's daughter to, to rig an election and to find her and report back Whilst he's there, he makes friends with Pedro Pascal and they end up doing acid and coming up with, with an idea for a film where they get together and try and rescue um, his daughter that's been kidnapped. Um, I'm not going to lie. I really liked it, um, probably for all the wrong reasons. It was just really nice watching Nick Cage um, take, the, take the piss out of himself. Um, there was a lot of, you know, uh, harking back to his old roles. Um, a lot of the fandom uh, and, and you know, all, 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 all of the, you, you could see um, at a Comic Con people buying a lot of the stuff that Pedro Pascal actually had in the special room in, in his mansion. He had like the, the golden guns from Face Off and all this kind of good stuff. <laughs> um, it's silly, um, it's over the top. Nick Cage ends up becoming a superhero action hero in the film you kind of know that's going to happen um what i really liked about this though is is it's a slight deviation away from some of the roles that nick cage has been doing over the last five ten years in you know these random ones that that we've probably reported back on some of the old podcasts um and and you know it also mentions those as well in the film it's really tongue-in-cheek um but it's also a really good film as well if, if if you're a big Nick Cage fan, if you don't like Nick Cage, you're probably not going to get much out of it. But again, if 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 you loved him or hated him throughout his career, um, either way, th- this is a nice, as I said, homage to to some of his previous roles, um, and it's a bit of a breath of fresh air actually. Him just doing a nice action comedy. Cool. I do want. Yeah, that is on my list. I'd give. I'd probably give it an eight out of ten, but I'm pretty biased. Shell watched it, liked it, but but she'd probably give it a five or six out of ten. I didn't realise we had a third generation back. Third generation Beckinsale. Yeah. Fair there we play. do. Yeah. That's good because that means more people will still watch porridge. <laughs> yeah. And going straight, but you know. Ah, oh, cool. No, that that is um. That is on my hit list to watch. And what what was that on? I bought it. Oh, okay. I rented it. So it's available for rent. Yep. Hmm. 
Written and directed by Cameron Crowe in his directorial debut, Say Anything follows the romance between average student Lloyd Dobler and overachiever Diane Court immediately after their graduation from high school. Producer James L. Brooks said the movie was inspired when Brooks saw a man walking with his daughter and wondered what would happen if the father committed a crime. Which is weird. That's an odd thing to think, isn't it? Yeah. Just, you or know, admit just... to thinking. You know, like... Yeah. But again, I suppose that's where some of these creative people come from. If Stephen King told people what he was thinking, he'd be, he'd be a crazy man. Up. Yeah. But if you wrote it in a book, it's all right. Yeah, exactly. But, sorry. That's all right. Uh, in 2002, Entertainment Weekly ranked Say Anything as the greatest modern movie romance, and it was ranked number 11 on Entertainment Weekly's list of 50 best high school movies. Hence fits into our high school super summer, super summer odyssey thing that we're doing too many mouses i keep pick up the wrong mouse um so mouse. Uh, what mice. mice what did i say mouse doing mouses mouses mices cheeses for the mices exactly so uh christian slater lauren dean Peter Berg and Todd Field all auditioned for the role of Lloyd Dobler. Robert Downey Jr. turned the role down. Kirk Cameron was also considered. And according to his sister, Shannon Lee, the late Brandon Lee, auditioned for the role and obviously never got it. It eventually went to John Cusack. Owen Sky and Jennifer Connelly tied for the role of Diane Court. <clears throat> and Elizabeth Shue was also considered... So tied for the role. I think right. they both they both tied for it, and then, if I remember rightly, Connolly then took something else, and that was and that was it. That, yeah. So it was like, okay. Well, you got it now. I think it was like, oh, which one do we go for? And then she was like, well, I'm doing that now, and it was like, okay, then. Fair enough. This is bizarre. Dick Van Dyke <laughs> and Richard Dreyfuss were considered for the role of Jim Court. I, I can see Dreyfus doing. I can, yeah, that's why. That's not so weird. But I Dick think Van Dyke could do a good evil. <clears throat> I think it would show. Because again, be he would be in the crime. He would be yeah. the lovable rogue who um, spoilers who you know does that. But it was alright because it was Dick Van Dyke. I mean, in real life now, if they suddenly went, we found five hundred bodies under Dick Van Dyke's patio. The world would be like, oh, that Van Dyke. He can do a lot of things, can't he? <laughs> You know, if it's hard drive, I'm like, oh, Dick Van Dyke. Well, you know, he can dance well. We, you know, I, I, think, I think, to be fair, we've all learned our lesson with Rolf Harris. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but he's not Dick Van Dyke. He did Rolf Ferouz. Again, I, I, I take your attention to the fact that when Dick Van Dyke was surfing in his 90s and passed out, what was the animal? Dolphin. No, on dolphins, it's the... Pla not platypus, what they called? Porpoise. Porpoises brought him back to shore. <laughs> they sense the, good. Yeah. And then it's, you know, he's, Dick Van Dyke is magical. And the world will be a dark place if he ever does die. Were they, were they cartoon porpoises? They were to him. <laughs> <laughs> to him, they were singing and dancing. I want to know what Dick Van Dyke has for breakfast. Sorry. I've anyway, yeah, that's fine. Mom. So Pamela Adlin auditioned for the role of DC before, in, before being cast as Rebecca. And Julia Roberts was also considered for the role of DC. Stone Gossard plays the cab driver. Diane uh, looks at and flirts with when she's stuck in traffic on the way to her graduation. There you go. There you go. It's a little, well, I mean, it's set in Seattle anyway, isn't yeah. it? I think, if I remember right. Pearl Jam fans. Yeah. Just for those younger kids that don't actually know who Stone Gossard <laughs> yeah. is. Or Mother Love Bone, if you're really into it all. Because <laughs> you would have been in Mother Love Bone at that point, I suppose. But uh, Before that, I think. I don't know, what year was this? 89. Ooh. Yeah, yeah maybe just about. Yeah. Yeah, because Crow was bumming around the music scene yeah. as well, wasn't he, from his Rolling Stone days. So, yeah, he would have helped him out. You can check that out in Almost Famous, which is basically his life. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So that's that's the kind of quick overview of, of the the casting and, and whatnot. As always, let's go with the memories. I've got no recollection of watching this until mid-90s, probably. So not a lot to go on from me. Yeah. Probably the same. Pretty much like everything that we've talked about before. <laughs> um, I do remember him being like a kickboxer. I remember his trench coat very well because I also um, had a trench coat when I was a teenager. 
and I remember the the thing where he's holding up a ghetto blaster. These were just scenes that I I can remember from my youth. Youth. And yeah, that for, stayed with me before watching the film. For for me, I can remember it. Uh, the ghetto blaster image, obviously, because there was that was on posters now, Athena posters, and yeah. everything else here for all those you remember Athena, the poster shop. Yes, we used to actually go and buy posters. Don't know why it died out, but it did. But um, but to be honest, my I remember watching it years ago, and this was always like I'm gonna get lynched now. Mm -hmm. This was the worst one out of all of them to me because I'm, I'm talking about at a time when i believe it was one of the sky movie channels years ago and they had like but it was like breakfast club 16 candles weird science this one um probably revenge of the nerds porky you know like all that sort of stuff was all on one of them the channel and this was like and i think because it is a more straight drama than it is a yeah, teen dramedy comedy, comedy. Yeah, comedy. Yeah, this was more. This was the boring one as a as a younger sort of early teen, a, early teen. teen with no soul. Yeah, I had a soul. I was just trying to sell it for stuff. So okay. this was the boring one. Okay, well let's go on to the plot then. Before <laughs> fisticuffs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so at the end of the senior year of high school, noble, and he is noble uh, as as we as we come to love yep. him. Uh, throughout the film, noble underachiever Lloyd Dobler, aka John Cusack, falls for Valedictorian Diane Court uh, and plans to ask her out, though they belong to different social groups. Ooh. Lloyd's parents are stationed in Germany for the army, so he lives with his sister, Constance, aka his real sister, Joan Cusack, uh, who's a single mother and has no plans yet for his future. So he's also like a surrogate stepdad as well, isn't he? Yep. Um, so Diane comes from a more sheltered academic upbringing, living with a doting kind of strange relationship going on there. <laughs> uh, divorced father, Jim, a, um, John Mahoney, who owns a, the retirement home where she works. Uh, she's going to take up a prestigious, pre prestigious fellowship in Britain at the end of the summer. We, we find out as it goes through. She, she gets accepted into um, top school in Britain. Yeah, so... It is a bit of a weird relationship that the father and daughter have. They are very close, like ridiculously close. Um, yeah. Especially for a, t a teen movie where like, you're not normally understood by your dad. Yeah. yeah. And she literally shares everything with him. Um, yeah, she can say anything to him almost. Yeah, <laughs> anyone would think that. Um, but, and you know, the, she is really sheltered. He's basically bringing her up to be... Uh, a, you know, a she's hot housed in uh, the... and to do you know to go to these prestigious schools he's and we find out he's basically giving up everything to make sure that she does it um but, spoilers well i know but, but, but <laughs> i know, you know he's you know i'm joking you know, since he split up with his wife he's made her pretty much the, the project for living mm -hmm. but yeah a bit suffocating some would say but she she goes along with it because she hasn't had a life outside of their relation it sounds almost like he's kidnapped her doesn't it yeah you know, she's not really she hasn't well i think in modern terms you could al almost kind of um categorize it as a as as gaslighting it's because it, it, there's also quite there's a few bits bits as the movie goes on yeah where he it's not it's not that doesn't shout her down but he tries to manipulate what she's saying into just shutting up and yeah you know mm -hmm. so i think he's he's a very controlling individual yeah uh, and you know john cusack lloyd dobler we we, we learn from the get-go that actually he's really likable he's really liked by his peers um he's liked by his girl friends and he's got a good relationship with them but he also you know the the dudes <laughs> at, at school also hold him in high regard yeah yeah, it's one He's, of the rare occasions where we're not following the loser in these types of movies, isn't it? Normally, we're always following like the outsider trying to be in with the in crowd or the. But his pr his problem is he doesn't know what he wants to do with for a living. Yeah. Um, and you know he's not fussed about it. He thinks well, kick, he wants to be a kickboxer <laughs> is the way forward, even though it's a a, a new sport. It's a great sport. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, 
but but that's the thing. You know, his peers love him for just being a nice guy. And a big shout out to Joan Cusack playing his sister because she's not credited at all officially. No. For some reason, even if she speaks, she has a good couple of scenes. Yeah, but and actually, she, the scenes she, she doesn't does, even get a credit. The scenes that she does that are really good. You know, it's like it's like they've got a chemistry going. <laughs> yeah, <it's> almost, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, even even to start with, yeah, you know, uh, you know, where where he is the uncle, and, and he just says, "Look, I'm not his father." I'm, you know, when she says, "Like, stop playing around with him," it's like, well, that's kind of that's my role. My that's job. what I do. Just. How many times has she played this sister? It's been a few times, hasn't it? Yeah. Over the years. Wow. No, no she was his secretary sister. as yeah, well. Yeah, she's been in a lot of his yeah, films, yeah. but not necessarily yeah. playing his sister. Yeah, she's but she's normally someone who looks after Grace him Point in Blade. some way. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, uh, yeah, but I don't know why she never got credit. I tried to look it up. I couldn't find any reason why. The only thing I can think of is maybe they were added a bit later or something like that. Don't know. To maybe to flesh him out, but I don't know. No real, no real explanation. But anyway, as always, you need a party in these films. <laughs> so Lloyd offers to take Diane to their graduation party, which is hosted by Eric Stoltz in an early role. Uh, and she agrees to everyone's surprise. And then when he gets to the party, possibly the first time ever mentioned in cinematic history, <laughs> he is the key master. <laughs> Which basically means he looks after everyone's keys who are driving. Again, showing the trust and responsibility that Lloyd has from his peers. Adam, what year is this? 89. So it's not the first time in no. cinematic uh, history. I thought it was before that. I don't know no. why. No, no, no. Much later. Nah. But it follows on from. But it, yeah, but it's a good. Yeah, possible. that makes more sense. Uh, he's taking Dan to the party. Um, oh, and basically, yeah, a lot of the his dudes. Uh, note that by him taking Diane to the party, it gives them hope. Yeah. So again, you know, he's a he's a poster boy for the dudes. And, and similarly, a lot of the the um, popular girls are saying, "Why is she coming with him?" That's it, because he's cool and he makes her laugh. Um, we also see Lloyd talking to his careers officer, Baby Newworth, who you'll know from Cheers and Frasier and other things. A few other things, but yeah, yeah. mainly that. Um, who moans at him for missing all of his career appointments and you get the whole, you need to choose a career, Lloyd, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, yeah, I'll do something when I want to. And again, that's your sort of underlying, just drawing a line under Lloyd's position in his life at that point. You know, and then the future's she goes to the party? Yeah. Because well, she gets out of the car. And yeah. Well, that was what I was going to say. She's going there, isn't she? Yeah, yeah she's, she's off to the party. She's, she's the... Like the one and only authority figure, apparently, that seems to be. Doesn't do a very good job, does she? No. And some would say. Inappropriate. A, a slightly inappropriate. But again, I don't think CRBs have been invented yet. <laughs> not there, anyway, not in that state. Are we also at the party? But then they've all left school. That, they, that, that yes. is the final day of their schooling. I think they're supposed to be 21 if you're a taught them. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Is, because well, is it is it the still, same? Is it twenty one in every? It's still frowned upon, but the idea of it would be twenty one would be a full fledged adult, right? And you've had no contact previously because you know you could be got grooming or whatever. Okay. But being a careers officer, see, that's a lot more hands on than a normal teacher. So I would think it might be a bit more stricter than that. But hey, it's Bibi Newworth. She's a psychologist. She knows what's going on. Yeah. As long as and how to manipulate any boy that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. As long as Fraser don't find out. And um, also at the party, we get the ongoing but awesome uh, love story between uh, Corey, Lily Taylor, and Joe, Laura Dean, and their relationship. And oh, is that uh, the one where she's she's written like sixty something songs? songs something, yeah, uh, and, and, I, and I'm going to play them all tonight. It's not yeah, and that that's basically any tosser with a guitar at a party. Yeah. Hell yeah. And for this chance, it was a girl for once. <laughs> so, you know, it's equal ops. But, um, yeah, and she just plays it all and plays it so well because she's just... Uh, deadpan's not the right word, but she's just... Yeah, and everyone else is clearly not enjoying it at all, but well, she's oblivious. Well, that's not true. The thing that surprised me is that actually there's some people, like, just doting on all of her Yeah, but they're, they're, all, they're all stoned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so... I've, but I think the party... Well, this scene really is just the, the backbone of the film here. You get everything underlined. 
you get how everyone is seen by everyone else. Um, the weird bit with, um, I guess they needed to somehow show his ambitions and career options that he doesn't really have a clue. So they put the careers officer at the party as well. Yeah. And it could have been a nice bit at school. Hey, before you leave, you need to do yeah. that. I don't want to go, you know, but hey, they fitted it in. And um, so you see what his friends think of him, what her friends think of him, what they all think of each other. And just the the vibe of the the gang that we're following now, including Crazy Corey and her guitar <laughs> and um, DC, the other girl. So, yeah, I think it sort of sets the stage, sets up the shop of what's to come. Yep. That their next date is a dinner at Diane's where Lloyd fails to impress Jim and the Internal Revenue Service informs the latter that he's under scrutiny. Yeah, that was embarrassing. <clears throat> Imagine your door hammering. Oh, he does that. I've got gas, yeah, damn it. People here. Diane introduces Lloyd to the retirement home residence and he teaches her to drive her manual transmission Ford Tempo graduation gift. They grow closer and become intimate, much to her father's concern. Uh, Lloyd's musician best friend Corey, who has never gotten over her cheating ex-boyfriend Joe, warns him to take care of Diane. See, Corey's good. Corey's cool, but so in this that you get that that dinner date where they're having dinner. Yep, it's one of my favourite bits of the film, mm -hmm. and I, I can't recreate what he says, but it's I don't want to buy anything, sell anything, or do anything that's been processed. I don't want to process anything that's yeah. been yeah, been brought, sorry, sold. Sorry, yeah. I don't want to sell anything. It's just yeah, I love that fit that that part of the film. How, how to answer a question without answering a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. And <clears throat> yes. So that it, so they grow closer and end up sleeping together in the back of his car. In, in, back of his car, rather, or well, her car. Can't remember which one's it is now. Um, yeah. Now, actually, take that scene. It's actually quite a, a sweet portrayal of someone you know getting together for the first time. Actually, um, and it's all kind of ruined because she comes home and tells her dad everything. I was it ruined for me by Peter Gabriel, but that's not a worry. <laughs> but um, yeah, but it, it, it comes back to this it, fact that you know she can. It's tell just her dad very anything. weird. Yeah, in the it's back of my head, weird. I'm going, mm, "Really, really, Ugh. Daddy, fill me out like an application form." No, <laughs> we don't want to know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just I don't know. If you're a girl, you're listening. You've seen it. What do you think? But yeah. again, is that her? Is that her shouted life of manipulation well, coming yeah, through it, where you know, she knows well, she, she, she knows party. no better? Yeah, uh, we see at the he, party he, that she doesn't he, feel any embarrassment or yeah. anything and about phoning her dad. Is her her dad. Mother figure at the same time. Yeah, and I guess maybe that's why we get so much of Corey. She's like the contrast. She's the other type of girl who's probably done everything with. Um, was it Joe? Joe. And like. You know, we see the result of that, and that's why maybe she's warning him. You know, take care of her; she's a good one. You know. Okay, so moving on. So, so Jim urges Diane to break up with Lloyd, feeling he's not an appropriate match for his little golden girl, and suggests she give Lloyd the great parting present of <laughs> a pen. Hooray. Worried about her dad, Diane tells Lloyd she wants to stop seeing him and concentrate on her studies, giving him the pen. Devastated, he seeks advice from Corey, who tells him to be a man. Meanwhile, Jim discovers the IRS cut off his credit when his credit cards are declined as the investment drags on, just as he's about to get it on with the um, shop lady. Yeah. yeah. At dawn, Lloyd plays In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel, which was playing when they became intimate on a ghetto blaster, uh, standing under her open bedroom window. Which she completely boom box. Boom box, whatever. <laughs> uh, which he completely ignores and rolls over and, and tries to go to sleep. I'll wait if anyone played Peter Gabriel at me. <laughs> Even Sledgehammer. Yeah, but it was cool more. back in 1989. I don't think it was. No, well, not for us, but... No, but no one was listening to Peter Gabriel in 1989. This is Cameron Crowe, oh, don't yeah, forget. I didn't mind Peter Gabriel. Yeah. If you, if you, he, he did yeah. the song with Kate Bush. I'm surprised yeah. that you, you haven't played this all your students. Another Kate Bush song. No, I've done um, Wuthering Heights. <laughs> but um, no one... No he, he teenager was, was busting out he, Peter Gabriel in 1989. They big, could afford. He was big in the 80s. Yeah, yeah but 80s. no teenager was playing him. I, I he would he have was been on, playing Motley Crue or G. No, 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 that's not true. He was on. He was on MTV a lot. Um, mm. He did Steam, didn't he? 
Which yeah, was, but no one liked it. Yeah, they did. They raved about it. He only liked videos because it had called plasticine but, people but in it. I think this is the same time that people loved Paul Simon's Graceland yeah. album. Yeah, well, that had musical credibility. And don't yeah, forget but it was how big... boring as shit. Oh, yeah, but we, we, weren't, we weren't playing it. No, but don't forget also how big Phil Collins was as well at the time. Yeah, Phil Collins, yeah. Peter Gabriel, no. Well, they were both in the same band. Yeah, but Phil, Collins, Phil, place, Collins, and they sound Phil Collins went on similar. and actually had hit singles. Peter Gabriel had a few couple of gimmick singles, which this wasn't one of them. I, I think history would say otherwise. He had quite a big... I, I think Phil Collins had more hits than Peter yeah, Gabriel. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying Peter Gabriel was also big at the time. Anyway, let's move on. Yeah, but not in move the, on. not to those people. He should have been playing Aerosmith mm-hmm. and Motley Crue and GNR. Well, that's least... not really a love song, is it? That he's trying to woo a girl with. Or mainstream... What well, good done, mainstream... Yeah. Every what, Rose what you... Has a Thorn. That was out in... No, yeah. that was 90, wasn't it? What was that? No, nah, that was 80s. That was um, Open Up and Say Ah. That was about 88. Well, 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 what so what, what year was right this? 89? 89. Yeah, so there was a lot more... Anywho. Even new kids. He, he played Peter Gabriel. <laughs> Yeah, let's let's move on. Let's, yeah. we, I think we've established that at least two out of the three of us in this room are not fans of Peter Gabriel. And don't I'm not, I'm not necessarily a big uh, fan. Um, however, I just don't think he'd be playing. W- it. One of the key things from from this part of the film, which kind of grated on me a little bit, is after after she dumps him, it kind of takes on a bit of a film noir uh, moment where he's driving around in the car, just speaking into his dictaphone. It's, it's like kind of, really? Yeah, a lot of people did dick phones in that, that time. Yeah, no, but why, why do that as opposed to just talking to your friend that you're going to give her the tape? It just seemed, it just seemed a bit weird. That, that was a big thing, though, wasn't it? People used to do that. They used to, that was a 90s, that was a like, late yeah, 80s, I know, 90s but thing. But just saying, looking back, it just seems... Oh, yeah, yeah, it definitely seems, seems weird now, weird. but that was like a as fashion opposed thing. To, you phoned people, you phoned your sister or whoever it was, or you phoned her, why not just and she's saying come around and talk about it it's like no I'm just going to drive around looking really moody he's being moody and yeah you know just felt a bit weird looking bizarrely Twin Peaks Agent Cooper used to do that and he used to talk to someone called Diane that he would leave the messages for on the tape (laughs) well you never know (laughs) does look a bit like um do he couldn't get um, yeah um Cusack so he got matey and the other that, bit I love about this as well, it just shows her naivety that she actually gives him a pen as a breakup gift as well. To like, be fair, that's, that's going to make everything me a pen. Yeah. To be fair, around that time, if you got one of those on Bullseye, you'd have been chuffed. Depends yeah. on what pen it is. Was probably, well, I mean, you know, you, you used if to it's get a Parker Blanc. pen for signing up to a pension scheme <laughs> yeah. or whatever it was. Blankety so, blank yeah. checkbook and pen. Yeah, 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 pens, pens, were big. pens were big in those days. <laughs> 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 and the whole, like, be a man as well you know probably can't say that anymore but you know tells him to get on with it and to be honest uh, no no, no advice. that's that's, that's you, you've taken that out of confidence it's, it's not be a man as in man up it's the the world it's, you think something like the, yeah, the world up. is full of, yeah the world is full of boys be a man, man yeah not man up as in yeah, go and smash go, up shit up. Yeah, no, yeah, no, that's what I meant. Yeah, but like, go that... a pair. That's not what she meant. No, it's a bit. That's not. The world is full of boys. Be a man. Yeah, yeah as in is... the boy. The world is full of the the jocks. The yeah. The 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 twats that just want to get yeah. their end away. And but he's she's saying don't be like them. Be just be yeah. a more of a grown up, but not. It's not grow a pair. It's not. Okay. You know. I think it is in its own way. Well, they say it in Mulan too as well. Yeah. Be a man. There's a whole big song about it. Check it out, Brett. You see. No Peter Gabriel you'd, there you'd, whatsoever. You'd, you'd have that playing in the car, wouldn't you? Move on. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been anything they wanted to be. No, but um, no, I like that. It's the fact that it's Corey that's telling them as well, which again, it kind of um, breaks all the stereotypes of these kind of films. Because you wouldn't normally have the bloke with the friend who's a girl who actually is a friend and they don't even tease anything. You know, it's not it's not a love triangle. It's just his mate, you know. Yep, yep. And, um, and she's the one giving him the advice. And, uh, yeah, no, it's good. And I like the, the continual... Um, the, con- the, the upped presence of the IRS as it carries along, you know. Starts with a knock on the door and now we're cutting off cards with you know the the threat's growing so then 
what happens next. Well, the next day, Diane meets with the IRS investigators. It's got to the point now where they're contacting her, who says that they have evidence incriminating their dad for embezzling funds from his retirement home residence. He suggests that she accepts this and uh, you know, goes and has a look at she first and see, make her own mind up, but accept the fellowship at the school because what's going to happen with her dad is going to get worse and worse. And then we get the bit where she like runs home and sort of checks through all his yep. drawers and stuff. Yeah, especially when he goes to the profile, you know, and he makes purchases with cash, probably yeah. be around nine grand. Yeah, nothing to... <laughs> and nothing to drive nice, home in a new to, car. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nine grand i wonder if he got that from a record store <laughs> um yeah and then um yeah checking the thing and then she checks everything and it's not true they're making me question my own dad and then suddenly remembers he's got like a safe i can't remember where it is it's now. a tea chest tea chest no that was it yeah on the side and it there's some lovely um, untouched notes in there big piles of money and um yeah she's not too happy yeah Just took my bit, but that's fine. <laughs> yep, so once she's found the money concealed at home, she confronts Jim, who tells her he took it to give her financial independence. Jim feels justified in doing so as he, as he has provided better care of if, if his residents than their families ever did. Distraught, she reconciles with Lloyd at his kickboxing gym, and he ends up getting a whacking great big kick in the face. Which apparently was legit. Yeah. And he ended up like a proper black guy. I never realised, as a side note, that... Gusak was that much into because he still he still practices now, doesn't he? Yeah, he's yeah. like a full on proper kick. I know he's done a few kicks in films and stuff. It makes sense why Brandon Lee was auditioning as well, I guess. <laughs> ah, yeah, Didn't yeah think quite of possibly. That. But, um, but yeah, he's been kickboxing since forever. Well, back in the days. Yeah. yeah, but it's um yeah, I was I was impressed with his technique. He saw the future in it. <laughs> but he'd learnt grappling as well. He was only a few years away from the UFC. He could have been there. <laughs> So at the end of the summer, Jim is incarcerated on a nine-month sentence. Lloyd visits him in the prison, saying he's going with Diane to Britain. Jim reacts with anger. And just, but nine months! <laughs> Embezzlement, fraud, took all those people's money for God knows how many years. Yeah, but they get the house, they take the house off him. Yeah. There's a uh, fine as well. There's a money monetary fine. Because they, 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 you get the scene where they're doing it, where the, the attorney's doing a deal with the solicitor. Yeah, that bit's brilliant. Give me that. No, what about yeah. that? Yeah, they right. they, like they got McDonald's and they just yeah. like they <laughs> just sat eating a McDonald's game. That, that was one of my favourite scenes. The, the nice, the nice thing about that as well is when he's he's chatting to her dad and he's like going through, you know, the thought about it and um, you know, she it would probably be best if she went there on her own to focus on her studies, all this kind of good stuff. And he's going, I'm glad you did the right thing. And then he said. But, but I, just, I, did, uh, yeah. <laughs> I decided yeah, yeah, yeah. that my job is to be with her. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like, oh, okay, great. So Lloyd gives him a letter from Diane, but she arrives to say goodbye and they embrace. She gives him the pen that she gave to Lloyd, asking him to write it to her when she's in Britain. Lloyd comforts Diane, who is afraid of flying. This is obviously when they're on the plane. Lloyd confronts, confronts comforts Diane when she's afraid of, uh, she's afraid of flying movie ends i think it's isn't it, it um it just ends as they're on the plane no but no no, no, no but this, the light, is, this is the nice bit because she's really scared of flying there's a bit of turbulence and he's going look it's everything's going to be okay as soon as the the, yeah. um, the the light battle sign comes on and they're just holding each other they hold on their arm and and it literally the film just ends where it goes bing yeah and i thought actually you know as film endings go that that's quite sweet cool. i like that. yeah because that kind of, you know, says or could say a load of things. It's not just the flight. Because you, you, actually, at that oh, bit, yeah. I was thinking, that, oh, my God, are they going to crash you? Something's <laughs> going to happen. But it's also setting up for the life as well. You know, yeah. things yeah. are going to be bumpy. Everything's going to be fine. Lloyd and Diane were 18 years old. So, yeah, actually, <laughs> that's, that was a really clever ending. I, I, I sat there going, hmm. Yeah. Like that. No, they were, I like the pen as well. Because he ends up with the pen. Yeah, and that yeah. Was the pen like, comes back to him. <clears throat> Although there was a little bit of me thinking, would that actually allow that in? Is that not a weapon? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the fact he smuggled in the letter yeah. as well, which they clearly hadn't checked and edited. Um, yeah, no, but yeah, it was a good ending. I still think he should have got longer than nine months. 
May, maybe in 1989 that was a big deal, but nowadays it doesn't uh, it's sound just, too much. You get deals cut in the States, so we don't oh, yeah. really yeah. go in for that over here. They're more interested in getting money. Yeah. I think the IRS have got their money back through the house and uh, all, all the, the ill-gotten gains. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's all they care uh, about. No, it's fair enough. But it just didn't, when they said it, it just didn't have that. The funny scene, don't get wrong, or whatever, they just sat there like, what about that? No, what about that? Yeah, that'd do. Yeah. I'll file a paper. Yeah, yeah. And they're just carrying out their lunch. And, but I was going to say, but it just, yeah, I don't know. For the, the big crime they made it out, it didn't sound that much. And I get that they take all the stuff now, but I don't know if everyone would have then, or a, a global audience anyway, maybe. I don't know. But nah, it's all right, know. though. But bottom line is... I mean, it's white-collar crime at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah. No one's been killed, if you like. There's no... It's not victimless crime, but it's not... Um, yeah, it's not yeah. murder. <coughs> That's true. And um, yeah, and then they end up playing. Play? Is, is that the right one? Is it, it white, white color crime? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's sound, right. One, right? Sounds right. Yeah. Cool. So that's it. That's the end of the film. Um, there was a television series based on the movie was planned by NBC and 20th Century Fox, but producers Aaron Kaplan and Justin Adler did not know that Crow had not approved of the project. When they found this out, they dropped it, which is a good thing. There. Yeah. Yeah, that's makes, fair enough. makes no sense to make a, movie, a TV show out of this. It's no. One story, done and dusted. We don't need to know what happens next. No. No one wants to know about fairy tales afterwards. No. Unless it's a comedy about how I, I would go like, wrong. I would like Cameron Crowe to do a new one now where John Cusack's running a kickboxing school in England. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you go, if you go to cultfaction.com uh, yes. and there's, and there there's, there's an article on there that um, you wrote that I wrote that basically I think he wrote this what was it Did, make your it, own trilogy or something yeah, like and that and then you, is this so the it's, it's, prequel to um, this is the prequel to Gross Point Blank, Blank yeah <laughs> and but this is the middle film the first film is the sure thing so basically it's the same character runs he starts off in sure thing and ends up in Gross Point Blank <laughs> read the article it's good yeah. <laughs> and then you'll watch those three films different. Coatfaction.com. He yeah. even gets to kill someone in gross point blank with the pen. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah. See, the pen is mightier than the sword. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you you sounded very cynical at the start of this, Brett. So, are you still as cynical forty years later? Well, thirty-five years later. Uh, no, I I enjoyed it. Um, I think it's top heavy. I think mean? I think we get everything in sort of the first half of the movie, and then it's just kind of we're just waiting for the fallout bit. Yeah, but again, but, but not 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 necessarily in a bad way. But I think everything we need is once you get to the dinner scene and the IRS knock the door, you're just like, okay, it's going to happen in a minute. Then you know, and you're just sort of, and um, yeah. No one would be listening to Peter Gabriel. Um, <laughs> but no, it's a bit, like I say before, it was because with everything else of that genre that was being chucked around, this was the boring one. But, you know, watching it now, I understand it a lot better and get the ins and outs and the the drive of the characters. And, um, yeah, no, it, it is a good film. Um, but, yeah, it's, I don't know. I, I actually think... Uh, Cameron Crowe sneaked in a, a, a cheek a chick flick in reverse. He kind of done a <laughs> go on and uh, expand on that. <clears throat> no, I, I, I think it's more. Um, I think it's more chick flick than team movie, but he managed to do it in a way that made it a team movie. It's not predictable. The characters aren't the usual tropes. In in some way, I mean, at the party, some are, but that's that's part of it. Yeah. But it's not the traditional character types. Like I said earlier, you know, we're not following the loser. We are following the brainiac. Um, the, you know, he's got friends that are girls and a couple of friends that are close in the day. It's not the normal. You know, he's not having conversations about how far he got or whatever <laughs> yeah, else. Yeah. You know, tell me more, tell me more, whatever. But um. I think it's almost Cameron Crowe wrote a chick flick that he turned into like a more of a team film. Fair enough. Yeah, potentially, but at the time as well, it 
that there were other movies about you know the the love between um you know teens um done from from the guy you know as opposed to to the female character mm-hmm. being the lead um funny enough eric stoltz who who was in this one was also in uh, some, some kind, kind of, of wonderful, wonderful with Leah Thompson, which which again is you know kind of a similar thing, uh, uh, not down and out, but uh, the underdog, as it were, mm. that tries to get with Leah Thompson. No, I'm not saying well, in this way, that, he's, not, was, he's not an underdog. But, yeah. He's not an underdog, but he's not he's not way so, up the pyramid socially, either, is he? He, you know, he just he's he he's one of the guys that just everyone knows, but no one necessarily for want of a better term, none of the girls fancy him or anything like that. He's just a guy that drifts between all the um, social yeah. tropes. Mm. But yeah, no, we're getting nothing wrong with that. But as I say, I think it's more a weird chick flick because she does say a lot to her dad. But hey, maybe girls did that in the 80s. Maybe they did. But then it's daddy's girl, isn't it? Like you say, she's been sort of... for. Lack of better, and she's sort of been groomed that way. Yeah, it's that, I mean, that's what's getting that at. Way. It's yeah, almost the, the it's gaslighting. gaslighting. It, it's coercive. He's basically just kept her away from everything, just to make sure she goes to, well, what can we assume is Oxford or something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> Rating. I would go. Um. So going to do a fan no, I'm just trying to think. I go. Six and a half to a seven on it because I think it, it's a solid enough story. I think it gets extra points for its uniqueness because it does take some different spins, as I've mentioned and we've talked about. Um, but I, I, I think it they need for me, I think I don't know, it just kind of you get as I say, you get everything in the first half, and then we're just um, we're snowballing down the hill to the end. That you know's coming, kind of thing. Fair enough. I would say, because you get a, yeah. Once 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 you twig to the IRS and the fact that he is guilty, it's just sort of like down to the hill to when it happens, and sort of. And the only bit you don't know is obviously you know, does he stay or does he go? You know, that's that's the the which is the traditional team movie ending a lot of the time, and it's normally at an airport. It's quite or cool because he wears a Clash T-shirt quite often through the. <laughs> He always likes his music. I'm still pretty sure in most films he's in, he wears his own clothes. Yeah. Yeah, six and a half to seven. Okay, Mr. P? Yeah, so I kind of disagree with Brett on this um, because when you're thinking about uh, the classic makeup for a story, it's got the setup, the, you know, something that happens, and they've got the, the, the summing up. So, yeah, they get together, and then there's a meal, and then there's the, the fallout from that, i.e., the split. And you know the investigation of her dad and their relationship falling apart, and then it comes together at the end. I, I don't don't see anything wrong with that. That's pretty standard makeup for for most films. Um, I, I I think where I struggled, and and this potentially is no fault of the film or the or the actors, but looking back on it now, where she's such a repressed character, I found a lot of and I didn't want to, but it always came across like some of her acting, or Diane's acting, was a bit wooden. And it probably wasn't. It's just the character she was playing where, again, she's so repressed living with her dad. Yeah. But w- when you look back with, you know, 2022 eyes, it kind of felt a bit wooden because of the character that she was in. Um, I struggled with that in <laughs> in, in modern days. Um but overall, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, again, because I didn't remember too much about it. There was just some really nice, clever bits in it as well. You know, as at the ending, I thought really clever. Um, the touching, poignant scenes were touching and poignant. I think they, they handled, you know, as I said, the love scene really well. Um, it wasn't full on, you know, uh, p- pleasure or done over the top. It, it was sweet and, you know, to the point. Um, and again, you know, it, it was kind of underplayed and, and didn't go on a lot of the teen movies that we've spoken about in the past where everything's over the top and yeah. everything's you know, bigger than life. It was almost you know, a, a lot more 
realistic and there was more realism in the in the script writing and and the the, the, the interplays between characters than than most of the other films that we've talked about, particularly mm-hmm. the likes of Breakfast Club and you know, even Dazed and Confused in some way, where it's kind of caricatures. That this was more of a real realistic take, <laughs> if if, it, if any, anything can be in a Hollywood film. Um, and and yeah, uh, uh, you know, uh, again another great springboard for for a lot of characters and a lot of actors in this film. That some of them were bit parts. that went like um, Niven, that again you know, went on to do weird and wonderful things. Let alone John Cusack's career that 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 blossomed from this as well. Um, yeah, um, rating. I'd give it a seven and a half, eight. It's a nine for me. I think it's one of Cusack's best performances. I was going to say something else when you were talking now. I've forgotten what I was going to say. But it's given us the iconic Gatto Blaster boombox scene, which has been, you know, reenacted. It even, in fact, turned up in Coronation Street a couple of weeks back, <laughs> which I don't necessarily watch, but it was on when I was feeding Chloe. And, yeah, someone character in there turned up outside someone else's house even like with a with a boombox and wearing a trench coat <laughs> white trainers the whole shebang it just it, it made me want to actually start watching Coronation Street again if they do that sort of stuff yeah but yeah you everyone knows I'm one of the John Cusack's biggest fans so yeah it's one of his standout performances it's a great film <clears throat> the I think what you said about the um it, it, it's subtlety is it, there's no character no character in there's over the top you know you get the party scene and when the guy, I've forgotten the guy's name now, but he was in Entourage and um, Niven. Niv- yeah, he turns up in yeah. Ghost Point Blank. Um, yeah. His character, you expect there to be more of that sort of stuff in it, in that scene. And then you expect it to be full on almost National yeah, Lampoon. Exactly. Or yeah, at least but, yeah. for like 10 minutes or so, but it's not. You, and you actually, know, it's a character at a party that we'd probably bump into. <laughs> yeah. And the same as when, you know, Diane turns up at the party in that white dress you know full on over the top as if she's going to a um a prom or something you're expecting her to be looked at for that and 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 ridiculed for what she's wearing but no one you know you get a look there's a few looks in the crowd but it doesn't he doesn't go down that cliched route of yeah of you know people making fun of her so it just kind of almost subverts what you're expecting to see throughout the entire film so for me it's a nine cool and there has probably hasn't been a year gone by in the last 20 years where I've not at least watched it once. Because I tend to go through the Cusack <laughs> movies <laughs> at least once a year. Yeah, because she's... She, I know you're saying about her being wooden and there were bits like that, but she's she's worked solid, hasn't she, right through? She's oh, no, 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 but no, this was my point. It's not her. You think maybe it's yeah. the script that... No, it, it's makes just her... a bit aged as a film and their relationship, but as I said, where she is, you know repressed and because of that you know her character is slightly wooden yeah you know, just not her acting ability but but you know looking back in yeah you know, from from a film which is 30 something years old it comes ac- or could come across if this is a, a new uh, person watching it that actually it's not great performance but you know my point is is that actually that's more of a character than anything else but, cool right well on that note you have been listening to the Cult Fashion Podcast. Episode number is not important. Six it was seven. A, thank you. It's a spotlight on Say Anything. As usual, don't forget, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook. Instagram. Instagram. That's the one I was trying to think of, the one I don't understand. TikTok. I can't get my head around that one. TikTok. And, and the mothership. And the mothership. That is cultfaction.com. If you want to contact us directly, you can email us at cultfactionpodcast at mail.com. In the meantime... I have been your host, Damien Hicks. I've been ably joined by, aided by, assisted by... Uh, Brett Summers. And Paul Hawkins. And not Peter Gabriel. No, never Peter Gabriel. Unless he, unless he adds the, 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 the song <laughs> to, to, the, to the play out. <laughs> I might just do that. <laughs> we shall see. Friends. So it's good night from me. Good night from me. And farewell from me.
Ah, <laughs> uh, Superman. What a slew break. Oh, fucking cunty. Motherfucking cunting assholes. Scordant. Anyone know what a scordant is? Immediately after the graduation. Fuck. Let's start that again. (laughs) (laughs) Might need to cut that bit out. I didn't mean that to be bad. I didn't mean that to be bad. I meant they're presented on the same thing. It's not like here's the proper Olympics, now here's the specials. Oh dear. Because it's like now they should be treated just like athletes, but we'll have their one separate. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure I can work that one out. He's so good. I can breathe. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, they're protecting on equal footing. <laughs> and I'll leave it in if it gets me on the last leg. Yeah. <laughs>